So I uh, just want to welcome uh, everyone to the uh, virtual town hall this evening. Um, this is our first town hall, hopefully one of uh, many, well, it will be one of many uh, uh, town halls on a variety of subjects. However, uh, for tonight, uh, we picked our first topic, which I thought was pretty important, especially having come through the election recently, uh, was to talk about low ver voter turnout and what are some of the things that uh, we can start to do to address that? Now, you know, I just want to throw a caveat out there. Democracy, in a sense, has been dying for decades, and we've got 90 minutes to fix it. <laughs> this is like uh, um, uh, a, a democracy escape room. But no, seriously, um, this will be the first of, uh, of, of future meetings about this topic, because clearly there are so many voices uh, so many groups and people that have uh, played an integral role in this have a stake in all of this that the panel we have tonight, although I'm extremely grateful to have these people here, obviously don't represent all of the groups that we would need to have part of this conversation. And, you know, our meeting's only 90 minutes long. And uh, so the plan now, and again, this is our first one, and we're all going to learn and grow together as we, as we do this. Um, but the plan is that each of our guest speakers this evening, bringing their own unique perspectives to it, will speak for anywhere from five to 10 minutes, uh, offering uh, their thoughts on various things uh, related to the low voter, voter turnout issue. And then following that, we'll open the floor for questions and conversation uh, from everyone. Um, and, and, and then when it's all finished, there will be a recorded uh, video of this, and we'll also have a report. So Reagan Bruce, uh, I want to thank her for putting all of this together. And uh, we're, you know, we're, we're learning as we go with respect to all this. So if there are the odd technical glitch, we will all get along together and figure it out. And uh, Simon Guthrie will put together a report of this after, and we'll share that with everybody. We'll share that with with all of you, we'll share that with the councils, uh, the clerks uh, around the region. Uh, the whole goal is to share the information with as many people as possible, to try and involve as many people as possible in this ongoing discussion so that between now and the next election, for example, municipal anyway, what can we do to hopefully turn around this, you know, Kitchener 20%, you know, low 20s in a, a lot of areas, and within Kitchener, for example, some wards as low as 15 or 17 percent turnout. So clearly, there's a lot of work to do. Um, it's almost like uh, democracy is dying uh, with a whisper rather than going out with a bang. And uh, you know, we we need to do something because, as as I heard, uh, I think it was Andre today on the radio mentioned, uh, if you don't have good turnout, you don't get good candidates. <laughs> and I just came through that election elected, so I'm not sure if that was targeted at me. Just kidding, Andre. Um, but, uh, you know, it's important to have a vibrant democracy, to have vibrant participation. And for some reason, people are tuning out and not getting involved. Clearly, all of you here tonight uh, taking the time to be part of this are showing an interest in wanting to save this, showing an interest in democracy. Uh, it's showing an interest in trying to make our community a better place, which can only happen when you all participate. So enough from me. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, we've got five speakers. Uh, I'm not really going to do a long, we're not doing a long introduction. We don't have time for all of that. Um, but the first speaker will be Andre Perella, who's an associate professor uh, of political science at Wilfrid Laurie University. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. Andre is uh, very experienced in local municipal politics. I hear him with Mike Farwell on the radio often. And uh, so I'm very glad to have him along with everyone else here. So, Andre, I'm going to turn it over to you to start, and then we'll introduce, I'll introduce the next speaker after you're finished. Thank you very much. And just to start off, uh, my comment about uh, quality candidates is in general, I, I, I qualified it. I said not to insult anybody who's been recently elected because we did elect some really good people to council this year. And, and there are good people who are being elected. But overall, low turnout does tend to produce um, a lower quality of candidates. Uh, but that's not really what I want to talk about. I was asked to um, 
maybe diagnose a little bit about what's happening with um, turnout as a whole. Is there any underlying cause that we can draw attention to? And uh, what I'd like to show you now is um, I'd like to show you, um, well, I'd, I'd like to discuss voter turnout, not in, too much in technical terms, but I want to look at it in, in, in historical terms as well. Um, maybe consider some generational change and also take into account campaign dynamics. So in history, we've seen that there were times when turnout was higher and then it seems to have gone through a slide. So that's some, some historical break, but within any of those periods, there are of course uh, election by election changes. So there are factors that are more short term and more related to a particular campaign uh, that may explain why turnout is on the decline. So I'm less interested in why turnout was down for a particular election. I'm more concerned about overall. Uh, and I'd like to show you this, this graph and it may be a little bit messy, but we'll clarify it. Uh, so this is overall voter turnout in, in many places. So the red line is in the Canadian federal elections. The uh, yellow orange line is Ontario provincial elections. Uh, the blue line up, up on top here is Quebec provincial elections. I also included a green line here for Yukon, um, the United Kingdom, as well as uh, at the bottom here, uh, usually at the bottom is a black line for American uh, presidential elections. So it's a bit messy. It looks like a scrambled uh, or uh, a, a very bad weave, but they're all kind of tending in the, in the same direction. They all seem to be, you know, pointing, pointing down. Um, and particularly, you know, if there is any any epoch, then it, it's something happened in around the 1990s that led to a decline. And you see that in the UK, you see that in the United States and Ontario federally. So there's something happening in the late 80s, early 90s that that turned off a lot of voters. And again, not just municipally, pretty much everywhere. Now, again, this is a bit of a, a messy graph. So let's maybe focus on Canada and Ontario. And what I'm looking for is some general big picture potential explanation as to what is happening. Consistently, turnout is lower in Ontario provincial elections than it is in uh, national federal elections. That's interesting to note. Let's add Quebec. Quebec consistently in Quebec provincial elections, their turnout is generally higher than it is in, in federal elections overall. So Quebecers vote more in provincial elections than Canadians vote in, in Canadian elections and, and Ontarians vote in Ontario elections. So already we're starting to see some, some major gaps here that require some kind of an explanation. Uh, we can add the Yukon and I, uh, Yukon is interesting because uh, at the beginning it was kind of low. Then they introduced the party system and, um, and, and turnout has been high. And I would say consistently healthy. Why? What is it that Yukon is doing right that the rest of us are not doing well? Um, you know, I can go on um, to other other places as well, but I also want to look at, at referendum results. You know, campaign general election campaigns come and go, and they could just be considered normal. A referendum is special, and sometimes it engages more people than the, a single issue may engage voters more than a campaign which may involve and implicate a, a variety of issues. And let's take a look at the turnout at some notable elections. Uh, the 1995 Quebec referendum, uh, I remember I was there and turnout was probably highest in any kind of turnout ever in Canada. And I remember people were, were in their wheelchairs going to vote. Um, so if you were, if you had a pulse, you made an effort to go vote. Why? In 1992, there was a referendum also in Canada and in Quebec uh, on the Charlottetown constitutional reforms. Turnout was still fairly high in, in, in Quebec, um, higher than normal in, in rest of Canada, but not overly, uh, not outstanding. In Ontario in 2007, we had a referendum along with a general campaign on the electoral system change. Um, and turnout was terrible. In Waterloo, we had a referendum on water fluoridation. Turnout, now it seems good, but at the, at the time, you know, it was considered rather weak. So uh, we, we have... Um, um, the, the, the phenomena here that even a referendum which focuses on a single issue may not necessarily engage the public. What is it that about the, the Quebec referendum in 95 
that is different than the Waterloo fluoridation referendum in, in 2010. Um, I'm also looking at other factors and I collected data from the last federal election uh, at the constituency level. So I collected all 338 uh, writings data on turnout. And I also look at the makeup of those writings. What was their labor force like? Um, particularly focusing on labor force participation, which is different than um, unemployment. Unemployment rate um, is based on those who are in the labor force. Labor force participation includes those who have a job and those who are looking. And I look at that because when labor force participation declines, it means more and more people are giving up looking for work. It's an indicator of, of economic health. I also look at the general age of the population in each riding. Uh, as we know, older people vote more. Um, and I also look at the overall urban rural mix of a constituency. And sometimes it's not so easy to tell. I mean, we can, we know when we're when we're driving through a rural area, we know when we're driving through a city, but some constituencies have a little bit of both. And uh, even a, a riding locally like Kitchener Conestoga seems on a map, it seems predominantly rural, but a lot of the voters um, are um, in Kitchener. Uh, so there is a, 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 a need to look at the what I call the urbanness or the ruralness of a riding. Um, because what anecdotally what I find is a turnout is higher in rural areas. And it could be because in a rural area, there's a greater community spirit and in an urban area, there's more anonymity. And the results that I found is that indeed, you know, and as and I wouldn't look at the percentages too much. This is overall trends that as a writing gets older and older or the average age, turnout increases. As the labor force participation is healthier, turnout increases. Um, unemployment has a modest, a more modest effect. So as the unemployment rate gets higher, turnout is lower. And I found the ruralness um, variable uh, a little less convincing, but yeah, the more rural um, a constituency, the, the more turnout. Uh, but there are other factors and I even have a, a, a top five of each. Uh, so the top five turnout in the last federal election is in uh, um, some are, 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 are mainly rural, uh, rural areas, but what's remarkable is the generally high level of labor force participation. And in the bottom five, the labor force participation is weaker. So that leads me to wonder whether uh, there is uh, something to be said about um, um, the overall and something I mentioned today on the radio um, interview with uh, 570 News, a certain social contract there was a time when we believed that as long as we work hard in any job, we'd be able to afford a house, buy a car, go on vacation. And that that promise has is gone. And now people work hard. They even are highly educated and work hard. But a lot of the conditions have changed. And it's and it's more much more difficult to buy a house, buy a car, and go on vacation. And not because of the recent uh, rise in inflation. And this is a phenomenon that's been happening, I would say, for several decades uh, particularly in the 1990s, but I would argue that it started in the 1960s when there were increased challenges to the to the welfare system, increased ch uh, challenges and, and uh, to unionized workers, uh, unionized uh, labor, and also increased pressures for organizations and businesses to relocate where it's cheaper to, to operate. Uh, so there's been structural economic changes uh, as well as generational change. Uh, the, the, uh, the older generations that had a sense of duty to vote and perhaps a sense of patriotism to their nation are being replaced by those who do not have to uh, replaced by younger generations who do not have that similar set of values. And a lot of it has to do with these older generations being raised in, in during the depression, during the second world war, when there was a need to come together. Um, so there wasn't th th that urgency um, that, that the newer generations have experienced. And uh, certainly, Parties and other organizations can mobilize voters. And I would add to that, in, in the case of municipal elections, candidates. It is important to knock on doors. It is important to engage with citizens. Um, and so a lot of these factors seem to have be more structural, however, in terms of the lack of, of, um, uh, uh, of the, uh, or the, 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 the damage to the social contract. Also, this idea of an election being seen as important. Remember, Quebecers vote more in their elections. People in Yukon vote more. Why? Well, they see their election as more of an expression of their identity, or they see that level of government 
as increasingly important. And, and the Yukon and the territories have become more important to their citizens. Um, so they're not just administrative units. And maybe municipalities are seen as administrative units, less as a community. So municipal elections may not a, a, a trigger any kind of identity among citizens. That's not always the case, but you know, maybe there should be a need for greater civic pride, being proud of being a citizen of the region of Waterloo, so that when you vote, you're not just voting for this candidate or that candidate or on a list of issues, you're voting because you like belonging here. Uh, so that is a factor that I think uh, needs to be taken into account is this idea of, of meaning. What does an election mean? Um, and uh, I think for some voters, we see that a particular election has greater meaning for them. And so they're more prepared to, to participate. So again, participation involves a lot of things. Uh, I'm not too sure how, the, how many of them we can easily address and fix for the next time around, uh, because a lot of these problems have been percolating for decades. Thank you very much. Andre, thank you very much for uh, those comments. Uh, when we had talked, uh, we had asked that you would provide sort of that background information. And I think you did an excellent job of doing that. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You'd think municipal politics, uh, because you're focused on your city, your community, uh, that there would be more of an identity connection for people because you know we say, oh, politics is local and you can't get much more local and pertinent to your everyday life. Maybe it's a matter of helping people better understand how important and relevant municipal politics is from, the, from when they get up in the morning to when they go to bed at night. Um, you had talked about engaging with citizens and knocking on doors and that's uh, I think a perfect segue to uh, our next speaker. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, Matt Rodriguez is here uh, with us. Uh, Matt, Matt and I got to know each other during the campaign, uh, more so, uh, I had known each other previous to that as well, but more so during the campaign. And I, I invited Matt to come on because uh, I can't think of anyone who ran a more comprehensive, thorough, uh, almost by the book, but beyond that too, not only by the book, but uh, uh, innovative uh, campaign, knocked on a ton of doors, probably had one of the best feels for what was going on in Kitchener uh, as anyone, uh, just and the team that he had put together. So uh, I thought it'd be great to have Matt's perspective uh, on this and, uh, and and provide us with some, some information. So Matt, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for coming out tonight. No, and, and thank you to everyone um, who took the time out of the, their evening to, to join us. It's, it's great to have such a, a, a group of people uh, together around this uh, arguably really important issue, not just for, for Kitchener, but for, for the region and, and for, for, for both Ontario and, and the country. Um, as Rob suggested uh, already, I'm Matt Rodriguez. Uh, I live in, in Kitchener um, and I ran in this uh, falls past, this past falls uh, municipal election for regional council. Um, for those who uh, may not be from the region or Joining us from elsewhere, regional council uh, covers the three urban cities and then the four rural townships. Um, and in Kitchener, there's four direct elected regional councillor seats. Um, and so this is a citywide uh, position. Uh, there are four uh, seats that cover the whole city of Kitchener. Um, and what was unique about this election uh, compared to many other municipal elections uh, or regional elections uh, was there was only one incumbent for those four seats. And so uh, there was uh, three existing councillors who had um, uh, decided to step away from, uh, from regional council. And so there was really this uh, opportunity um, to, to come out and, um, and, and run. And so uh, I was one of uh, 14 candidates um, so certainly a large number of people came out to uh, um, uh, to, to to join uh, this uh, the, the run in this election, and so um, you, you know running for regional council is effectively like running for mayor uh, in terms of the audience you need to reach and the uh, scale of election uh, you need to run. Uh, Kitchener covers. Uh, three federal ridings uh, or three federal provincial ridings and so it, it's a, a significant geography that um, needs to be covered and so that's a bit of context about the perspective I bring and I'm going to touch on two key points that um, or reflections rather that uh, I left the election with and um, uh, I did unfortunately come just shy of one of those four seats um, but um, as Rob said I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish as a team and uh, the conversations that we were able to have um, over the, the few months of the uh, election period. 
Um, and so the two reflections I want to share are around um, uh, the, the sign bylaw and some of the changes that we saw this year on the signs, um, but also some of the unique perspectives that I think I gained um, engaging with residents in almost every neighborhood of Kitchener. Um, so on the neighborhood side, it was really interesting um, going around um, to each of these neighborhoods and how the conversation evolved and, um, uh, and, and, and to the level of awareness that different residents in different neighborhoods had of the election, um, whether they be, um, you know, say it was a, re a rental community or more predominantly own, uh, ownership level of community, um, uh, the socioeconomic status of the community um, really reflected in um, overall awareness of the election, uh, that it was even taking place. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the crux of the election. Uh, is general awareness that it's happening. Um, and so uh, I'll get into that a bit more with, with, with signs, but it took a long time for people to understand, oh, there is an election this fall. And this was the third uh, election uh, locally or in Ontario in, within a year. And so uh, there was you know, a significant um, um, you know, fatigue, uh, but also a lack of awareness. Um, and so it was really interesting going to these doors as we got closer to how that awareness shifted and or didn't shift. Um, there were still neighborhoods by the by by September by October um, where people didn't know you know when voting days were. Um, they um, you know didn't know how to vote. They didn't know what a voting card was, how to get it. Um, and, and you know, as a as a as a side note, and as a candidate, it was always sort of internally frustrating because you're like, I'm having panic attacks every day, and um, you know, there's uh, how, how can't you know? But th there's so many reasons why, and I think it's, it's really important that we unpack what those reasons are, um, because so many people live in such a bubble of fear and engaged just in the bubble of engagement. Um, but once you've left that bubble, um, it, 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 for for one reason or another, it's tough to to become aware of uh, these things. Um, and so going to my third point and, and sort of just coming back to um, um, uh, back to the sign piece, this was the first municipal election that Waterloo Region had run um, with a, this uh, election sign bylaw that prohibits um, candidate signs on regional uh, roads or uh, public property. So you could have a business on a regional road that would take your sign. That was OK, but you couldn't put it on the boulevard or on public property. Um, and so this was a really unique um, uh, change because again we're covering all of Kitchener it's a massive geography um, but it, it also provides you know so, so it, it has both pros and cons and I think um, on the pro side it really helps level the playing field um, you know there are um, uh, you know those large signs that you see on the side of a road are about 30 bucks a pop um, so certainly a financial barrier to many candidates um, it, you know, there's also the resources that are required to get out there um, to uh, to put them in, take them out, to maintain them. Um, sign vandalism happens all the time, um, and so you know, I don't want to weigh too much into this bylaw and, and the, the merits of it. But um, there was th those sort of elements that I saw as beneficial to my campaign. Um, but what it also meant is there was lower election visibility. You could drive along major roads, you could drive through major intersections. There's no signs. Um, you know, unless you were driving on certain streets and certain neighborhoods, you really weren't seeing signs. You weren't seeing those visual daily prompts on your commute home or your trip to the grocery store. Oh, yeah, there's an election. Oh, I should look at that candidate or uh, I should look into this election a bit further. And so um, my, my one reflection and, and one, one thing that I think we all need to work on is promoting um, um, uh, greater awareness of the election throughout. And I think um, the municipalities need to take a larger role in this, whether it's um, you know paid social media ads, um, paid signs on public property, just noting that it's election day. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different tools, and we could probably have a whole brainstorming session about what we could do. Um, but we need to have those. Uh, if we're going to ban signs on public property, I, I think we need to find ways to promote just the fact that it is election day, that it is voting. Um, and then my final reflection. Um, is just around um, expanding voting options. Again, there's a whole town hall on, on um, different voting methods, but um, I think voting options includes different voting dates, different voting locations, different voting means. Um, for example, um, uh, the closest uh, voting station to downtown Kitchener, uh, which has a high proportion of people who walk, bike, or um, take transit, or just don't own a car, um, 
uh, was uh, you know up at a community center, um, quite quite a bit of a ways away if if you uh, don't uh, pass by there frequently, um, and so um, you know that was just an interesting reflection of um, awareness and um, you know seeing those lines. So again, I'm seeing lots of com comments come up in the chat about some of the reflections about uh, two tier government and and all these other uh, these other pieces, um, and I'd love to get into them, but I, I'll, I'll stop it there. Um, and, and thanks everyone for 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 joining and. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Listen, I, I'm going to ask you because you, you can't stay till the end, and I just want to—I do want to ask you this because I saw uh, Dr. Laura Penn had, had mentioned uh, raised it too, and you're out there, and and you know you've been to like 16,000 homes. You're out there talking to a lot of people. Your team is out talking to a lot of people. Did the two-tier issue come up because you're out there and people maybe be wondering, are you the ward guy? Are you, you know, <laughs> what's, what's the region, et cetera? So what was your, on, re, on reflection, if you can recall, what was the experience like in, in talking to people about the two-tier uh, system that we have? And undeniably, the ballot was long. Um, you know, if, if you, uh, again, if you aren't from Kitchener, there was you know, four, you could vote for four people for regional council, you could vote for four tr school board trustees, you could vote for your mayor, and then you could vote for your ward councillor, um, and, and then your regional chair. So um, it's a full page, lots of names. Um, and and um, you know, people. I think after the advanced polls were commenting how long it was, and how they, they joked that they needed a crib sheet to uh, to head in there. Um, and so, certainly, I think there's an opportunity. You know, uh, again, that's a whole other town hall on, on, on our on our two one or two tier system, and, and there's certainly yeah. pros and cons to it. But um, sure. but it, it it definitely um, there's a lack of understanding of what the region does, and uh, the region also is a bit of a higher level of government. Um, you know, if you're uh, if your neighbor's playing music too loud, you're likely going to email or call your city councillor uh, and not a regional councillor. Um, and so there's this uh, separation of, of um, at, the, at least at the regional level, uh, of responsibilities and how people connect to them. Uh, city councillors are often more out in the local community, at community centres, at the library, um, you know, at those local events. Um, and, and there's a bit more of a, a tangible relationship. Again, just my, my thoughts on it, but um, I yeah, think you, you, you there, it was a long ballot. Yeah, and, and, and on that, you raise a good point. I mean, if you're if you have to look up 14 different candidates to select your four regional councillors in Kitchener, and then some wards would have had five candidates running for the one spot there. There's 19. You've got three or four mayoral candidates uh, and and the trustees school board. You, now you're into like 25 people. You 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 have to look up to see what their positions are and try to find that information. So yeah, that could be quite a load people would say they 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 you know clipped out the record and did a spreadsheet and and there's only certain people that can do that who can take that time to to do that that research um and and so um i'll leave it at that um thanks for having me rob yeah thanks, and Pat. um and uh really appreciate it okay yeah matt thanks for your comments i'm gonna hang out for a bit i'm gonna hang out for a bit yeah super thank you very much uh, and I appreciate it. I know there's lots of things going on this evening. I just want to thank everyone that's uh, here with us tonight uh, on this issue. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Bowman. Uh, Melissa is the one person I always watch for on Twitter to see what's uh, what's happening uh, in, in Waterloo Region. She's uh, a very uh, avid um, reporter uh, in her own on her own uh, in terms of what's happening in the community and uh, her her uh, citified. I think is a, 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 an excellent uh, platform uh, that she uses to get information out into the community. And she's uh, an impartial, fair uh, raconteur of what's going on in the community. And uh, we always have great coffees together. So <laughs> Melissa, thank you very much for being here this evening. I appreciate it and I'll turn it over to you now. Perfect, thanks uh, Rob. And I'm just gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully that is working for folks. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, we know that voter turnout has been declining and voter turnout in last year's municipal election was disappointingly low. Uh, that's concerning because ideally our elected officials would reflect the desires of our larger community. When so few people vote or participate in public engagement opportunities or council meetings and the like, uh, decisions can be made that are not representative of our community's vision for the city. Uh, let me actually put this in slide mode so you can see it better. Maybe, there we go. 
Um, so author Jerusalem Demses states that um, because participation in local politics, even at the ballot box, is extremely limited, elected officials are often swayed by just a handful of emails or phone calls in opposition to, for instance, a new apartment tower. Additionally, when people do take the time to engage with the city, it's often to express their concerns about an issue. And while it's important that we have a process that allows for this, it can cause politicians to believe that opposition to an issue is the dominant perspective when it very much may not be. Again, Jerusalem Demsas notes that a measly 14.6% of people who showed up to public consultations were in favor of the relevant projects. As local media reacted to the low voter turnout last October, uh, former regional councillor Tom Galloway said that one of the challenges with our local elections, and we were kind of touching on this with Matt's conversation, is that they can be complex and that individual voters must do a lot of the work themselves to figure out whom to support, since there are no political parties at the municipal level. In Waterloo Region, we have tiers, wards, municipalities, townships, school boards, so it can be challenging to figure it all out. I mean, just uh, look at this slide here. We're chatting about it already, but there's a bit of a visual um, to show you what voters are expected to, to figure out. And I think Matt made a joke about uh, taking, you know, a crib sheet, like a cheat sheet in. And I honestly tell people like that that's something to consider because that's a lot of names to remember. And if you're not following things closely, um, you know, you can get names mixed up or, or forget somebody or uh, you heard about somebody in the news, but it might not be for the reason you wanted it to be. And so um, it's a lot to figure out for sure. So, you know, I guess one of the questions is, is there a way to make it easier for voters to figure all of this out? And so author Dave Meslin uh, thinks so. And last fall, he decided he wanted to do something about that. Uh, in his writing of Grey Highlands, Meslin created the Grey Highlands Municipal League with the goal of increasing voter turnout by 50% with a budget of $1 per voter. In his municipality, that worked out to a budget of approximately $10,000, which was spent on uh, creative advertising to attract candidates, as well as print um, full color uh, candidate menus for every resident, which you can see here. Uh, it was actually a two-sided piece, but here's just the, the front side of it. Um, and while many consider low voter turnout as inevitable, especially at the municipal level, Dave Meslin saw that as an opportunity. He said, we have this great opportunity with municipal elections. Let's show people that it can be done differently and then it can be done better. The Grey Highlands Municipal League's website states that their job, post, uh, job posting leaflet, which you can see here, uh, helped the Grey Highlands uh, area break records for candidate recruitment while the rest of the province saw record uh, lows. And Dave Meslin isn't new to the local democracy game either. He's the author of several spacing articles and a book on the topic called Teardown, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. In his TED Talk, Meslin challenges the idea that apathy is the cause of low voter turnout. Instead, he identifies seven barriers that keep us from taking part in our communities, even when we truly care. Meslin concludes that we, redefine, we must redefine apathy, not as some kind of internal syndrome, but as a complex web of uh, cultural barriers that reinforces disengagement. So after Meslin's experiment in Grey Highlands, he concluded, if you want to boost turnout on election day, it has to be a four-year process. You have to create voter engagement for the entire council term. And Meslin had some thoughts on what this could look like. He says, you have to get people paying attention to the budget process every year, which is happening right now, um, if people aren't aware. Although I was taking a look at people who are joining this panel, and I'm assuming most people here already know, are well aware that budget uh, discussions are happening municipally. Um, we need to make sure that people feel involved and engaged in how their money is being spent. The Grey Highlands Municipal League mailed out colorful brochures and leaflets for the election. And Meslin thinks that there'd be a lot of value in having a group like theirs in creating fun educational materials between elections. And they're also considering hosting events and policy debates. So I guess the big question is, was it a success? Um, Gray Highlands saw an increase in candidates running, which is a good thing. However, come election day, voter turnout was nowhere near where Dave Meslin had hoped. He concluded, 
I spent $10,000 doing outreach on this election. I think that's the municipality's job, and it should probably be at least twice that amount, which is still only $2 per voter. If you're not spending $2 per voter in an election year to help people be informed about the election, I kind of think you're not doing your job. So where does that leave us exactly? I think there are some great takeaways from Meslin's experience with the Municipal League. There's also other examples that we may want to incorporate or uh, expand upon. For example, some have wondered about the possibility of municipal political parties. Now, it's not an idea that I currently support, um, but one of the most common questions I was asked at the door when I campaigned in 2018 was, which party are you with? And we have political parties at both the provincial and federal level. So I can totally understand why people assume that that's also the case for municipal politics. Uh, one concern with political par parties at the municipal level is that they may simply just bog down uh, the day-to-day -day decisions that need to be made at the local level, which reminded me of a quote, um, which is attributed to Fiorello LaGuardia, that there is no Republican or Democratic way of taking up the garbage. While it's an American reference, I appreciate its point. Both Guelph and Kitchener uh, collected feedback from residents after this past election. They asked questions about whether you voted, how you received information about the election, and if you voted, what was your experience like? So going back to Meslin's point that low voter turnout may be less about apathy and more about barriers, this approach seems valuable. Of course, my biggest concern with this approach is that I suspect most of the people willing to do this survey are likely to be the same people who voted in the election, um, which is probably very similar tonight. Um, I'm guessing most of the people who are attending the um, discussion on low voter turnout probably voted in the municipal election. So I do think that feedback is helpful, um, but we also really need to hear from those who did not vote. Uh, ranked ballots have often been suggested as one way to increase voter turnout. Uh, London was the first municipality in Canada to use ranked choice voting in 2018. However, in November 2020, the province enacted Bill 218, which removed the option of ranked ballot elections for Ontario municipalities, meaning that London and any other municipality hoping to offer ranked ballots instead had to use traditional first-past-the-post system. So I think there are some great examples of small things that we can do to remove existing barriers and to encourage more people to engage with local issues. But I also believe that we need to not simply focus on the issue only at election time, but in the four years in between, which is why I'm thankful for opportunities such as tonight's virtual town hall. Uh, I'll conclude once again by referencing Jerusalem Demses, who says, Democracy is at its best when the views and needs of the people are accurately transmitted to the representatives, the representatives act, and voters express their approval or disapproval in the next election. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa, um, for those comments. Uh, much appreciated and, and very informative. It, it, it is interesting. I, I, re, I remember thinking when um, the decision was being made to remove the signs from regional property, uh, and I'd always been sort of, I've been a proponent of signs. Uh, there's arguments all over the place uh, about that, but, um, you know, certainly I always felt it helped incumbents because if you're a new person, when I ran for mayor back in 2010, uh, my name was, you know, not well known in many parts of the township. And in order to get that out there, signs were probably the best way for me to let people know that I was running. I appreciate the cost, but the alternatives are just as costly, whether it's billboards, television, radio, all these other forms are, are expensive. But you raise an interesting point, maybe just touch on, if we're going to eliminate signs, and I remember the the reason for eliminating the signs was because there was a cost to bylaw to go and, and investigate sign infractions or deal with sign infractions. Certainly, maybe that money that we were spending there and more could have been spent on promoting the election and the fact there was an election. I just didn't feel that that was happening very well within uh, uh, Waterloo Region. What, were, what was your impression about any, any work by the municipalities to promote the election? Uh, yeah, so I mean, as um, somebody who ran in 2018, um, I think there's a hmm, non-financial cost in addition to the financial cost of having signs, like the amount of time that uh, we spent on just like 
ordering signs, making signs, figuring out where signs are going, picking up signs. Like it, it took a lot of time. Um, so there is a financial cost, but there's also this non-financial cost um, that doesn't get spoken about as, as much. Um, that being said, uh, I would love to see just general signs um, from the municipality highlighting some details where people can find more information, um, very much like some of the stuff that Dave Meslin was referencing. So people can be aware. I mean, Matt shared some of the challenges in getting the word out that the election is coming. Again, probably most of the people here, um, like me, are well aware uh, months, if not years, in advance of the upcoming election. But that's not the reality for most people. So I think um, municipalities investing um, well in some of this is important. And I'll just give a shout out to uh, WaterlooRegionVotes.org. Hopefully I have that address right. Was such a good resource for, for me um, when I was writing about citified um, issues and that type of thing. Um, and just a great resource um, for anybody who is wanting to find information. Um, and that that is citizens making that happen. Um, to be honest, if I was with the municipality, I, I would feel a little bit of shame that they were not coming anywhere close as a good resource um, in, in that way. There were attempts, but I think we need to do a lot better. Yeah, and you mentioned a good resource. I guess the question then is, were people being, how are they being made aware of the resource that's available? Someone like you who's savvy on municipal politics generally, but to the average person, how are they being made aware of getting access? Because like, certainly the internet you know, we used to say, well, seniors are having trouble getting on the computers, et cetera. But, you know, as time goes on, that's less of an argument. Everybody's, my dad's on WhatsApp all the time. He's 86. But I mean, there's lots of, lots of people that uh, are becoming more savvy these days. So yeah, thanks a lot. And, and you, you mentioned ranked ballot, and that's something we'll talk about in, in future, uh, at a future town hall, for sure. I think that's awesome. a, a great, uh, a great shout out on that. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jorg. Broshek. Uh, Jorg is an associate professor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University and, and full disclosure I'm a graduate of Wilfrid Laurier University. I didn't pick these two guys because they're associate professors there. It's just uh, as we're putting this together uh, their names came across my desk as people who were attuned to pol politics and part participatory politics and we had some very good conversations and so I wanted to share that with everybody here. And uh, there's certainly others in the community uh, that we'll be reaching out to in the future. But York, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for being here with us this evening. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob, and uh, to everyone else. I think uh, I want to highlight again that this is really important uh, that we have this conversation. So thank you very much for, for creating the space here. Just trying to uh, share my slides quickly. Can everyone see the slides now? Good. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so my background is uh, like I'm I'm interested in Canadian politics. I'm also very interested in what's going on in the Waterloo region here. Um, as a resident of Kitchener, uh, but I'm also a comparative political scientist. So what I've been trying to do is uh, tapping into uh, the research that we have um, and trying to make sense of a few points uh, 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 related to the municipal elections, regional elections in 2022. Um, first of all, what I would want to add very quickly to uh, what Andre said as well, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, we all know participation, the duty to vote, et cetera, has been declining since the 80s, at least. Um, but uh, voting is just one, obviously, form of political participation as a broad repertoire. And other forms of uh, participation, often called unconventional or non-conventional forms, have actually gained importance. So I think this is also maybe something for the future debate, if we talk when we talk about voting today, it's one form of participation in a democratic in a democracy. Um, what I would like to point to is first uh, the first question is really uh, to present four forms of non-voters uh, again based on on the literature and I try to uh, use this and make sense to make sense some sense of some of the things that we've witnessed uh, here uh, in the last election. So I think, um, or I should also mention, first of all, that these are ideal types. So this is, this is very stylized. 
And uh, of course, there's overlap uh, between them, and maybe there are other forms as well. Uh, but I think these four types here strike me as really important. So first of all, uh, we have in all liberal democracies uh, a potential of voters that is notoriously not interested, and we won't probably uh, get them involved. So this is something I think we need to accept. Uh, second, and I think many have already touched uh, uh, exactly on this problem, uh, there's a significant share of voters who I would say was temporarily uh, disengaged. These are voters who participate usually maybe in federal elections, maybe also in provincial elections, but uh, not necessarily on the municipal or regional election. Why is that the case? First of all, that was already mentioned several times. Unfortunately, uh, many people see municipal elections as second order elections. Uh, nothing could, could be further from the truth. They are super important, but not in the perception of uh, many residents. Second, that was mentioned as well. It was the third election since September 2021. Uh, uh, it was complex, uh, multiple elections at one in, in one at once, councillors for two levels, executives, and school board elections. Uh, then another argument, no party politics makes things more uh, time consuming, uh, too many platforms. Uh, another argument that was mentioned, we are growing. So we had many new residents who maybe not have been familiar with this, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a broad category. I still don't think it's a catch all category. Uh, there are different fa factors, all are more circumstantial, but I think they explain something. What I find more interesting now is really looking into the more structural factors that may prevent people from voting or not. And I think here we need to look at uh, two broad uh, types. Um, the first one I would call, like this is a form of alienation one. And for, for the sake of having a better label, I would call them frustrated, often angry, but still privileged uh, uh, residents or citizens. So what I mean by this is essentially uh, the fact that we live in times of paradigmatic change. Um, and many uh, feel that the political system, our discourses, et cetera, take away certain privileges from them, or some would also call it the freedom to whatever. Uh, that they taken, have taken for granted or still take it for granted. So culture, lifestyle, tradition. And I would call this uh, uh, one incarnation of uh, uh, our tantrum democracy. It often reminds me of my eight and 10 year old uh, when I say um, uh, screen time is over. One good example, traffic calming. I have a quote here from uh, Waterloo uh, City Councilor Diane Freeman in an article by Jeff Outhead about the speed limit. I think I've sufficiently had the life beat out of me by the people in my ward, which raised the question to me at least, okay, for 30 kilometers speed limit, seriously. But this is, I think, an important part. So what are these people, what, what, what are the options here? These people have two options. Either they are so frustrated, they exit, they do not vote, or they exercise voice. If there's, if there's a, a good, sort of party or whatever so or they go and protest etc these are typically anti-establishment uh, uh, voters if if they have the chance so interesting for the regional election i was quite concerned but uh, positively surprised that we did not see a cultural backlash uh, not even in the school board where i was most concerned so uh, apparently this group is maybe uh, bigger than it often appears. It's a minority, it's a loud minority, but it has definitely potential to grow. Uh, again, we have a lot of challenges, housing, climate, etc. So this will not go away on the contrary. And then the fourth group, uh, the last one, uh, I would call uh, them alienation two, structurally disadvantaged and marginalized. And this is really like uh, hard research has shown this for decades in many different contexts, it applies socioeconomic factors are the most important factors for voting, but also for participation in general. So if you if you wanna run a campaign, you need money, you need time, you need resources, you need civic skills, you need to, to be able to argument, uh, but also even to vote. I mean, for many, it's a challenge to subscribe to a newspaper and get informed or have having the time, thinking about a, a single mom with two jobs, low income jobs, that's the problem. Uh, it's not just, it's about class here. It's also about race uh, in Canada as elsewhere. Economic inequality is often, very often, racial inequality. 
And then this creates these, uh, what I would call self-perpetuating representation gaps, because uh, those people who represent us are often affluent, white, uh, et cetera, and, and there's a gap and that leads to further disengagement. I think this is probably one of the most important problems. So let me conclude quickly with uh, some, what I would call parameters for reform. I think three, uh, ish, or three points uh, on a general level would be important. First, uh, education and what, what we call here at the university, experiential learning. Uh, we need to create more active uh, engagement opportunities and not just the online feedback uh, Waterloo region engaged, which is very passive and is used by those people who are already quite informed anyways. So there are interesting experiments with this and, and uh, political scientists have explored this and accompanied this citizen assemblies. We had the BC assembly, for example, in the early 2000s, uh, so-called mini publics. The point is we need to expose citizens to the idea of deliberation to, 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 to make them uh, realize how complex democracy can be and how difficult it can be also to argument. Second, and again, I think this is super important from my point of view, socioeconomic factors are the most important ones. So whatever we can do at the municipal and regional level, and some things we can do, we need to uh, undertake to address social inequalities and inequities. Uh, we had some modest uh, improvements, if I think about the municipal and uh, the school board level as well. So let's build on these achievements. Uh, stakeholder relationships, I think, are super important here. We need to narrow the representation gaps. And here should be, and I would love to talk if we have time later about this more, uh, Indigenous communities. It is an embarrassment that we have literally no Indigenous, indigenous representation within our institutions of local democracy. Uh, so moving forward for the next town hall, there should be maybe someone on the panel uh, who is indigenous and could, could speak to this problem. This is a huge problem. We are a multinational democracy, and that applies not only to the federal provincial level, also on the municipal level. And the third and final point is really better communication. Uh, I mentioned that yesterday morning when I was asked by Greg Norris, uh, what can the media do? I do not do not amplify these stereotypes if possible. The taxpayer, of course we are taxpayers, but we are more, we are citizens. And citizens are also, citizenship has something to do with trust, with solidarity, and not just I'm the taxpayer. And often these underlying assumptions, it's a simple principle agent relationship. Uh, you're not doing what I, what I voted you for. Uh, that's not how democracy works. Uh, and I quote, use, a lot, I like a lot of inspiration that I, I, I sort of take from is a book that originally appeared in 84, and I had to read this in my first year as a, a, a political science student back in Germany from Benjamin Barber. We, we are live in a thin democracy where this is often the predominant uh, sort of understanding, and we need to get to a strong democracy. And by this, he means not that democracy is a way of life because it isn't a way of life for most people, but a way of living. That means from time to time, we need to engage. That needs to be the default. I wrote a short paper on this, if anyone's interested. It's just actually for my own clarification, ordering my thoughts. I'm happy to share this or send you an email. It's on my, on my personal website where I expand a little bit more on this. So thanks again. And yeah, I look forward to this discussion. Jörg, thank you very much for your thoughts. Um, you've, you've certainly raised some dynamics there that I think uh, many people would uh, really appreciate and, and clearly shows, as I said at the intro, there's so much more to explore uh, with respect to this. I, I was just wondering if you just quickly, uh, just maybe give a little more detail on a, a citizen's assembly, uh, what we're talking about. And then after Sam Nabby speaks, I'm going to call on, if she wants, Jennifer Ross, who I saw in the chats mentioned she was involved in the Citizens Assembly, and I'm curious about that. I'm going to ask her to say a few words about that if she if she wishes. No pressure. Uh, but but Jorg, if you could just uh, just comment on that a little bit. Yeah, so they are very different models, actually. Um, essentially, the idea is you create a body uh, that is really representative. Uh, so one way to to do this is a lottery system where you. Uh, pick people that really represent the diversity of the population.
population and invite them to participate over an extended period of time on a certain topic. So in different parts of the world uh, and different democracies, uh, different ways of doing this have been have been used. Uh, for Canada, again, there were several, but the most prominent one was really the BC Citizenship uh, Citizen Assembly, which was also accompanied by political scientists and graduate students from Simon Fraser University, where, yeah, there were different, it was about the electoral reform, uh, where political scientists sort of uh, explained these are different types of systems uh, that would produce these type of results, and the citizens had to uh, deliberate and and uh, make a proposal, a report that then served actually as the basis for a referendum. Unfortunately, the thresholds were so so high that it was well almost impossible uh, to meet, and and they didn't. They they barely uh, failed actually. Okay, interesting. Thank you, okay, and thank you, Jörg, for that. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to our last uh, speaker, last but certainly not least. Um, I can't think of anyone that's more certainly uh, active in uh, our community in many ways, not only in downtown issues and Gockle Street creation and hold the line to our rural uh, urban uh, countryside. And, and, and actually, I first met Sam uh, at a hold the line uh, farm uh, festival uh, when I was running for a regional chair. So that would have been back in 2018. And uh, we had a great chat then, and I was always, I've always been impressed watching Sam do the different things that he does. And what I love about community activists, these are people that sh want to share their knowledge uh, uh, with the community. They do it for free. They volunteer. They spend so much time. They spend so much time researching. In fact, Sam recently reached out to me when we were talking about employment lands and talking about North Dumfries and uh, what's happening out there. And again, just volunteering his time to make representations on plans in other communities. And uh, Sam as well, uh, we all look forward to his next uh, Sam live local tour uh, and his hip hop uh, revolution. So Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Rob. And, uh, and thanks to all the other previous speakers. Um, I, I think we have a really, uh, really great breadth of knowledge here. And I've been really excited to sit back and listen to what you all have to say. Um, I also recognize a lot of names that are in the audience here and in the chat. And I, I'm really, really grateful for, for such an engaged um, group of people, whether we're, we're speaking or whether we're chatting or listening. Um, a lot of names that I recognize from being engaged in city council delegations or, or different um, opportunities for activism and improving our, our neighborhoods. So. Um, we're here because we're talking about local democracy. We're talking about turnout, voter turnout. We know that that voter turnout was low in the last municipal election. And uh, to me, that's that the turnout itself is not the issue. The turnout is a symptom. And uh, what's it a symptom of? I think a lot of our, our thoughts turn to it's a symptom of apathy or it's a symptom of indifference and people just don't care as much as they used to. But I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I, uh, in, in my day-to-day -day life, when I talk to my neighbors, when I talk to people that I work with, um, people care about issues that are going on in their neighborhood. People care um, if the garbage isn't being picked up. People care that the sidewalks aren't being plowed. Um, people care if the, the rec center is too overbooked and their kids can't play sports. Um, people care if they're if if they can't find daycare spaces, and I, I feel like there is a high level of political awareness in the community, but um, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily organized or we know who the right person is or what the right level of government is to address that issue. Um, so that's a, a, a part of the reason why I got involved in a group called Hold the Line Waterloo Region is about that disconnect and. Uh, Hold the Line exists to promote and champion the idea of the countryside boundary line, which is the line that separates Waterloo Region's rural areas, farmland, and protected environmental land from our urban areas. And uh, that line was created in the, um, in the Waterloo Region Growth Management Strategy. It's, uh, it's a way to stop urban sprawl from going too fast, from going too far. And uh, it was challenged in the 2015 regional official plan. So, so this was something that the uh, regional government 
said, here's the line. After this is countryside, you can't build more subdivisions. Uh, some landowners who had bought farms in order to turn them into subdivisions appealed it and fought. And it went all the way to the Ontario Divisional Court, actually. It went, it went past the, the uh, uh, Ontario Municipal Board and it went to the courts. And, and this was a situation where our regional government actually fought very hard to protect that vision of a sustainable community where we can grow upwards instead of outwards and use our, our land and our resources efficiently. Um, but the, the problem was I didn't see, and, and the other organizers behind Hold the Line, we didn't see a lot of public engagement and public support and public will behind that. Um, so in that case, um, we ended up at a solution that was basically split down the middle. Um, the line did expand, but not as much as the developers wanted it to. So that was 2015. And um, there was a, a few community organizers uh, that got started making this, this idea about a hold the line festival or a hold the line bike ride or something to raise awareness about this this very obscure policy that's actually quite important. So how do we get people excited about um, a line on a map that's in buried in chapters and chapters of a regional official plan policy? Well, um, we got a musician, Richard Garvey, folk musician who many of you might know, uh, Sean Campbell, um, who's a, a, a community organizer in the, in the co-op space and, and uh, all around great human being, Alex Saflarska, a local business owner at a cooperative brewery, Together We're Bitter. Um, I was involved. We had also Tyler Plant, who's a creative uh, creative um, designer. And, and we put our heads together and we said, Look, we're going to have an event. We're going to have it on a farm that's near the line. We're going to invite foodies. We're going to invite local restaurants. We're going to have the environmental activists who already know about all this stuff. We're going to have the cycling community come out. Um, and we're going to do a bike ride, a local music festival on a farm where we can taste food that has been grown here in Waterloo Region. And the, the whole point of that was to unify and bring together people who may not have been in the same room. So if we set out to do a public information session about why the growth management strategy is important, we may not have reached people who care about agriculture or um, who care about local food or like going to their local restaurants. We might not have reached the cycling clubs that meet every weekend to go out for a ride together. But when we, we organized something that was um, interactive and engaging and it was a full day of fun. And then while we have people there together, we have an opportunity to talk with one another. We have the opportunity to say, hey, I know you love riding your bike every Sunday through the rural roads of Waterloo Region. Did you know that there's a threat that line could be extended? And do you want to put your name on our mailing list in case there's ever a threat and we need you to sign a petition? Um, it's really bit by bit com communication and um, opportunities like that, that that have helped build a lot of public support for the countryside line. So we had a, a festival in St. Jacobs in 2017. We had a festival in Wilmot in 2018, and that was also a municipal election year. So we invited all the candidates out as well. Um, and I, I do believe that you know through that effort and through the hundreds of people that came to both of those festivals, this whole concept of the countryside line has become mainstream in Waterloo Region. Um, the media talks about it a lot more than they used to. Politicians talk about it a lot more than they used to. And it's something that people now understand when they think about going to the farmer's market or when they think about um, uh, the new subdivision that is being built next door to them. Um, that's a concept that's on their minds. So the way we achieved that wasn't by focusing on the issue itself and bringing it back to focusing on turnout. It's not about focusing on turnout itself, but focusing on the things that will eventually um, let people connect those dots to everything else that they care about in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so I don't know if I have time for one more story, Rob. I, I wasn't really keeping track of the time. Yeah, no, go ahead, Sam. Uh, absolutely, go ahead. Oh, good to oh, share well, these, Sam, it's good to share these experiences because it, it kind of connects with what Melissa was commenting about Meslin and the sort of stuff he's talking about where 
you're doing things to engage the community on issues of local concern. And that, that gets them to build a buy into their community and, and, and an interest in what's happening municipally because things like hold the line, if they're concerned about the boundary, who are the candidates that support the types of issues that are important to me locally? So go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just pivot a little bit and, and then talk about something um, in downtown Kitchener, which is Gockle Street. So I believe we, we took a very similar approach um, in terms of trying to meet people where they're at and trying to build a broad coalition to, to, um, to achieve a certain policy objective. So the policy objective is um, there's not enough public space downtown. There's not enough um, parks, parkland as we have a growing urban population. And uh, you know some of our streets, even in the downtown, are are still too car centric, and they're not safe for people. So uh, people that are that are walking and and cycling and using wheelchairs and pushing strollers. Uh, so there was a, a really great opportunity that came where, um, I, as a business owner, I, I talked with our business improvement association in the downtown um, and asked them whether they would support and provide a little bit of funding to try to have a pop up event on Gockle Street. And Gockle Street is a tiny little two block street that connects City Hall with Willow River Park in downtown Kitchener. And it goes right past the old bus terminal, which had been de decommissioned. So that road was not uh, being used for buses anymore. It actually wasn't being used for much of anything anymore. And um, I spoke with Melissa, Melissa Bowman here, uh, who was at the time involved with the uh, Victoria Park Neighborhood Association. Um, so we got business association, neighborhood association, we talked with artists, we talked with tech companies in, uh, who had offices in the area and wanted to see something like this happen, and, and really came up with lots of reasons and lots of brainstorming about what could we do with this space, what, how, how could we better serve the community with this space, instead of just a, uh, a two block stretch of road that nobody uses. So long story short, we really built a strong case because of the diversity of people that were involved. And it wasn't just people who were city hall watchers, who, uh, who are the ones always uh, sending letters to, to council. It was really trying to engage our broader community. Um, and like I said at the beginning, people are politically aware. Um, I think a, a, a family who owns a dog, they know that maybe they, there's not enough dog parks downtown. That's something that they'd like to see. We interviewed some high school students. They said there's, uh, there's not enough basketball nets and skate parks downtown. Maybe that's what they would like to see. We interviewed musicians. They, they, would, they wanted to see a, um, a little performance stage on Goggle Street. And it doesn't mean all of these things necessarily have to happen, but now we know that there's broad support for doing something better with this space. And the, 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 um, the, the good news story at the end of all that was um, City Hall did approve a budget to turn Goggle Street into a pedestrian street. That work is now uh, you know, well underway. You can go to Goggle and, and see the picnic tables and it's been blocked off to cars. But the, the effort was so successful that they also committed to doing a second street downtown um, near the Kitchener Market, which is going to be underway uh, this year in 2023. So um, that process is full of little details that, that we can debate and discuss. But um, the big picture here is that uh, by getting a lot of people from different walks of life who maybe have different priorities, but can all work towards the same goal, um, we were able to make a change happen that was uh, really celebrated by everyone involved. Yeah, and Sam, I, it makes me think too, uh, when I think of City of Kitchener with the Love My Hood grants to get people involved in their community, uh, Regional Waterloo, which just started the Upstream Services grants, uh, you know, those have so many impacts in our community beyond just engaging within the community, but making our, our communities a better and safer place. So thanks for sharing those experiences uh, that you've had. I really appreciate you being out tonight. Now, um, I, I, I want to thank Mike Maurice for uh, popping in, and, and I saw in his chat that he mentioned the citizen assemblies. And if Jennifer Ross is still out there somewhere, uh, I'd love for her to uh, step forward if she felt so to talk about her citizen assembly experience that she mentioned on the chat line. Jennifer, are you there?
Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I um uh, I just want it to be brief. Um, the Citizens Assembly was on, um an Ontario wide, and it was on workers' democracy and um their voice, and the various ways we could improve uh, the feelings of workers while not um, going over the rights of obviously um, business owners or unions. And uh, we were done by uh, sortition. We had 1,200 invitations go out to people and we had 32, I think, participants from all over Ontario, um, young, old, um, um, minorities, um, of all all kinds. And the most remarkable thing I found was the ease of consensus that you wouldn't believe in Ontario could happen with with a question or two, and then everyone agreed. Everyone. It was amazing to me who, you know, believes that uh, rural people and urban people are um, enemies to the death. And um, it wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. People want a job. They have a job. They want a bit of respect. They want their input to be relevant. And universally, wherever we were, whoever we were, um, it was easy. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a great way of learning. We had uh, many ways, many lectures, many studies to read. Um, it was a lot of work. It, we needed more time, as I'm sure every Citizens Assembly would say, but it was great. Great. That's it. Jennifer, thank you uh, for sharing that. It was totally impromptu, and uh, I appreciate you stepping up and sharing that experience. And uh, you touched on a good point. Uh, democracy is a lot of work. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we don't realize that we have to put in that time. And it's sort of a two-way street. People have to, you know, make the time to, to become educated, to become informed. But we also have to find avenues to find uh, ways to, to make that information more accessible to a broader group of people in, in better forms. I was just wondering if there's any, um, uh, I, I see some candidates, I know uh, Carrie Williams is out there, and I, I'm just wondering if Carrie wanted to uh, share a few thoughts uh, about her experience uh, in, this la in this last election. Yeah, one sec, I'll, I need to find my camera. Hey there, Carrie. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, the camera thing isn't um, allowing That's me. That's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Um, this time was a little different than the last time because, as you know, like we ran together in 2018 as well. So I think like I learned a lot of lessons, but I did find at the doors this time like people were significantly less engaged than they were the last time. I don't know if it was because it was just this fatigue of voting so many times, but it was kind of staggering to me that I would say the most engaged people were downtown because there was a particular issue that they were focused on, which was the homeless encampments and just general inflation. Um, whereas when I got out into the suburbs, people were more concerned about things like the reduction of garbage bags, which I was kind of surprised about because I figured most people, you know, they only throw out so much garbage and I didn't think that would be such a hot button issue, but I guess out in the kind of suburbs, that was one of the main things. So uh, it was just, yeah, very enlightening of the fact that people were not as engaged as before. And a lot of people were unaware of the election. And I don't know if it was because of the signs and everything we've talked about, but I mean, that's possibly one explanation. Um, and I think also people are just kind of I don't know, they're, they're very discouraged, I think, as well, like with the province and the federal government. And then there's also the education piece where a lot of people don't know the distinction between what a city councillor would do versus a regional councillor. So I would try to, you know, take my time and explain to them the differences because they were like, OK, well, if I'm going to vote for this person, what are they about? And then what would they actually do? So 
um, it did take a little bit of time, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I experienced. And yeah, I don't know. Do you have any other questions or? <laughs> no, I, not no questions. Just if you wanted to, just sharing what it was like for you. So it's interesting to you know because you ran in the two elections. Um, yeah. You know, you showed very well in 2018. And, and we're victorious uh, solidly in uh, in 2022. Uh, but it's good to get that perspective. It sort of ties in with uh, Andre's comments about the the decline, and you're experiencing that anecdotally firsthand as you're knocking on the doors and seeing that 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 uh, disinterest that seems to be seems to be building. Um, I, I I didn't know if anyone wanted to comment, and we're not we're not bashing anything. I don't want to think we're bashing newspapers or local media. But um, I, I didn't, I, and I plan to, uh, at a future event, hope to have some uh, local media representatives here so they can give us their perspective on, uh, you know, how they see their role and how they carry out their role during the campaign. But it does come up from time to time, uh, the issue about local media and, and what have you. But before we get into that, uh, I see Brooklyn uh, has her hand up in Brooklyn. Yeah, absolutely. Jump on in and talk to us about your experiences or any other comment you'd like to make. Hi there, everyone. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Brooklyn. I ran in Kitchener Ward 9. I was the runner up for, for that, that ward. Um, there are a lot of things concerning uh, or just elections in general that I've been paying attention to for a long time. Um, I've I've worked at every election I've been able to ever like since I turned eighteen, um, and be, have always uh, paid very close attention to that sort of stuff. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, blocker blocks for this election, at least was just the amount of candidates. Um, on my ballot, there were 33 different names. Um, and and it's sort of confusing too, when it's like, okay, so you vote one for this one, one for this one, four for these, for this position, four for this position. And it's like, that. that just is too much to ask of people who are not, able to spend the amount of time it takes to research 33 different candidates. Um, I know that I didn't research all 33 myself. Um, so I can't imagine uh, what it would be like for like a single mother who has way less time on her hands than I would. Uh, I, I don't know what the solution to that is. I've thought about um, maybe like a, just splitting up the um, city and regional election cycles. Um, but I also don't know if that like that midterm sort of style would actually lead to lower turnout because of the increase in number of elections. Uh, it, it, there's just so many things to to pay attention to. Um, but there was this one quote that I, I repeat a lot that um, a person while canvassing told me, um, just uh, just some citizen uh, I was speaking to and, and they said to me that being able to pay attention to politics is a privilege. And that is something that we need to actively dismantle. Um, we need to make it as easy to get into as possible. It needs to be easy to learn as much about your city as possible and about your candidates. Um, there's so much in the way of even just finding out what's happening at your monthly city council meetings. Um, like at Kitchener, if you wanna look at the agenda for something, if you want to look at the record, uh, the way that someone voted, uh, you have to know the date that the bill was voted on. You have to go into this, like it, basically just a file folder um, that they have on their website, like you would have on your computer. Uh, the search function does not work very well. 
And it just is so impenetra impenetrable to people who do not have the time to actually learn this system. Um, yeah, it's it's very frustrating to see how much there is blocking people from being able to participate in the first place. And that really stops people from wanting to vote, wanting to participate. Uh, Brooklyn, I just wondered if you could share, uh, we were asking Matt earlier about his experience at the door and the issue about confusion possibly between, you know, you're running as a ward candidate in Kitchener yeah. and then the regional <laughs> campaign is going on as well. Every single time I spoke to someone who didn't know about the election there was this big I, I had a spiel that I I uh have already lost but uh like that I that I would talk about like all of the different candidates there's the school board trustees there's the the mayor there's the regional uh chair there's the regional counselors um and then there's me uh running for ward it is just so many layers for people to pay attention to but i also don't want to amalgamate because the way that it's worked in toronto and and ottawa has been very negative for the downtown core uh where the suburbs get to choose the mayor um with basically no input from the downtown yeah, interesting. Um, you brought up the A word, and that'll be a topic for a future uh, town hall, absolutely. But you know, you're right. And if you think about it, uh, if people are voting provincially or federally, it's like one party, one candidate. They're not voting for the prime minister and their local representatives, mm -hmm. voting a party. And, and, and that could be reflective of their voting for the prime minister and, and you know, not yeah. so much the local candidate. But for the municipal campaign, You've got all these layers that you have to explain. Yeah. People ask me about my my party all of the time, like Melissa yeah. said. Um, yeah. I had some people say that they were voting for the Green Party. And then, but both my, like, my uh, opponent and my signs were mostly green. So I had oh. no idea who they were talking about. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, <laughs> I just wondered if uh, any of the panelists had some last words they wanted to share. And then I'm going to read somebody says to me, A was on here. Uh, and uh, he uh, ran and won in, uh, I'm not sure which ward that is exactly uh, out there. It's the southwest corner. And uh, if he'd like to uh, say a few words, I'd love to, to hear from him. So I'll, I'll open the floor to the, uh, our, our panelists if they had any last words they wanted to share with the group and uh, Ayo, you can just pop in anytime you wish. No? <laughs> okay, I'm just waiting if the panelists wanna say something first. Yeah, okay, no, go ahead Ayo, go ahead. Uh, good to see you here, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight, really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. And I saw the title for this, I thought it was important to be a part of this, just to um, get some ideas and thoughts on what some of the, uh, what could be happening and what we can do to uh, to make things better. I come from a different country. I moved from Nigeria six years ago. And for me, I'm a bit shocked. I guess as an immigrant, when you come in, you have the, you know, the joy to be in a place of freedom uh, and uh, where there's so much opportunity. Uh, so I, I find it shocking sometimes uh, to see the numbers to be quite low. Um, when I went door to door knocking, just like many people here, people didn't know, I would hear things like, oh, there's another election coming up. Like, which one is this one now? Uh, so that came up regularly. Um, I've had times when people would ask, just like uh, Brooklyn mentioned, what party do you represent? Uh, I had someone shut the door on me because uh, they said they only talked to a certain party. And I was just confused. <laughs> it's local politics. What do you... What are you talking about? Um, so there is, I, I really don't know where we need to start, but I do feel like we do need to um, get started somewhere. But I will say this, because I know there are a lot of uh, different people here um, from uh, different stakeholders. One thing that I've noticed that I've come on is prior to getting on, you were so focused on connecting with the community 
Then you get in, you have all these 30 things that you should not say not do so that you're not in the media and you're not, uh, you don't become enemy of the state, uh, so to speak. So you connect with people to get in, then you get in, now you're afraid of the people. Uh, th th that might be the wrong words or the wrong phrase on how to say it. Uh, so how can I, I know Melissa wrote something online once and I sent her a message on Twitter, like, let's get together. Like, I don't know anything about this. So I'm just going to honestly say, I don't know anything. I'm just here to learn. It doesn't mean I'll be able to solve the problem, but I just want to learn. And even if it doesn't work out well, would it be okay where we can still respect one another um, through this? And we might need to get our politicians back to that place. But who knows, two years from now, I might not be speaking that way. I might be hiding as well, just like <laughs> everyone else, because you say the wrong thing and then that becomes the, the headline and the newspaper and you're trying to defend yourself through. So I think on both sides, uh, we might need, the conversation should not just be about the voters. It should also be about how do we ensure the politicians are connecting with the people and looking to connect with the people. And there is... Uh, that thing is whatever that thing is. I don't know what it is. Is holding us back from building that connection with people. So anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, and and you know, I think that's a great point because when I was mayor back between 2010 and 2014, I always had this view: Why are we only seeing people knocking on doors during the election? Why are we not connecting and reaching out in between the election? And and so. I used to I used to hold actual town halls for them, one in each ward every year, and we get fifty or sixty people coming out. And this is what was and that was the genesis for this concept. Seeing how successful the virtual concept is, I wanted to do that with this on issues of interest for people in the community, and uh, we'll be doing a lot more of these. But but you, Ail, stay bold, stay true to yourself. And as far as I'm concerned, you, 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 to get from point A to point B, sometimes we have to walk on some eggshells. We're going to break some eggshells. But as long as our intention and our hearts are good, you know, we can't we can't be and shouldn't be faulted. And so uh, and I know you're out there uh, doing the right things because you're out meeting with a lot of people. You're educating yourself. You're new. You're learning. And, and I have no doubt you'll be very successful. And so thanks again for those comments. I, I wanted to call on I wanted to call on Josh. Uh, Oliverio, and I want to thank Melissa for reminding me that Josh is here. Josh is uh, 15, uh, has a podcast that he does on politics, and uh, I know he only has the best guests on because he had me on his last one. So, <laughs> but uh, Josh, from your perspective, uh, tell you know, I, I, I'm telling you, stay on top of municipal politics. It's not all glamour at the federal and provincial levels. But uh, give us a few of your thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Rob, for giving me the opportunity to speak, and um, I really appreciate the discussions that have been going on this evening. I think it's a really important discussion to have, especially at the municipal level, um, with the the frankly alarming low voter turnout that we saw um, in the, the recent municipal election. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, um, my podcast is all about talking about the issues in all aspects of Canadian politics, so provincial and municipal uh, including, um, that and how those issues and how those decisions made impact Canada's youth. Um, and you young people and their voter turnout is often very low as well. We're talking about why some of the issues are. Uh, with that and why why it's important, but also um, how we change that. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, as a young person, and for this example, we'll define a young person as a voting young person. So we'll say between 18 and 25. What is that person's um, reason to vote in a municipal election? Chances are they're, you know, at a post-secondary institution. Who knows, you know, what their housing conditions are. But chances are they don't care about, you know, garbage collection or that kind of thing or all the other issues that typically just apply to homeowners. What is that reason that young people want to vote? Um, and I think that that's something that we need to reflect on and find ways to engage young people in the political process. Um, because... And obviously, we don't have a whole lot of data on this right now, but I think that 
the low voter turnout, the very low voter turnout that we've seen um, among young people um, in these uh, elections, and specifically in the municipal election, um, is an indication that when these people get older, they might not come to vote. And there's an experiment and there's a, a working idea. Um, and I talked about it in my podcast as well. I had a couple of guests talk about this, um, that there's an idea about lowering the voting age to 16. And I've spoken with MPs from various political backgrounds around the idea. And there's some research overseas that shows if we lower the voting age to 16, um, we're able to have them vote once they get really busy, they go through university, they go through that post-secondary education, which is usually a non-voting period. And then when they come back to, you know, maybe they have a job, maybe they have, you know, a more stable uh, living conditions, you know, they're not moving around, um, then they return to voting. Um, and then that becomes, you know, a habit. Um, so that's not a municipal specific um, issue, um, a municipal specific solution, but it's a solution in general for increasing voter uh, turnout um, in the long term. So I think that's an interesting uh, proposal. Josh, thanks a lot for those comments. You can see he had me sweating by the end of that podcast with all the grilling he was doing. Awesome. That's fantastic. I, I think that's a, a great point to end on is, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing a dynamic that's going on. Uh, clearly the youth uh, are the are the ones that are going to you know save us from this decline in democracy? And uh, I think Josh Josh's voice was an excellent way to conclude tonight. Um, so I want to thank everyone that came out. We are going to make available uh, uh, Simon Guthrie, uh, uh, who who works with me, will be putting together a uh, synopsis of uh, of our conversation today. There will be a video replay available uh, of this uh, as well. And uh, we are going to continue this conversation with more voices, more people, and uh, uh, as well as other town hall issues uh, like we've talked about. And I might even do a free for all. Uh, ask your counselor any question you want to ask uh, <laughs> and see how, what answers you get. But um, <laughs> this is important. And, and thanks to my panelists uh, that came out today, uh, Andre Barella, uh, Matt uh, Rodriguez, Melissa Bowman, uh, Jörg Broshek and Sam Nabby, I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your schedule to do this this evening. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and and uh, if, if, if you all could just hang on, and there might be a few questions from some press after. But thank you to everyone that's been part of this. And I look forward to engaging with you more. And if you have any questions or comments that you want to share with me, reach out. It's rdeutschman at war, regionalwarloo.ca. Would be uh, thrilled to hear from you. Take care.